Welcome everyone to the second part of the cellular respiration video brought to you by Lanterna. So today we are going to look at the details of cellular respiration and we're going to start right in. If you haven't done so already, please watch the video that comes right before this one so that you know all of the different actors and molecules involved in the process. If you've done so, we can jump right in. So again, the four stages of aerobic cellular respiration, so using oxygen, are glycolysis, the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. As promised last week, we are going to look at my original notes from when I took the IV. And so I'm going to also include some other graphics and pictures to make it as understandable as possible. So let's jump right in with the first step, which is glycolysis. So glycolysis is the breakdown of one molecule of glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, into two three carbon sugars. And there are four steps to this. Before we get to them, I want to make one point very clear. It's always important in these processes to talk about where things are happening. So here, for glycolysis, we are in the cytoplasm or the cytosol. So outside of any organelle, just in the cell fluid. Glycolysis has four main steps. They are called phosphorylation, lysis, oxidation, and finally ATP formation. So as you can see on the picture here, we're going to start with a molecule of glucose and we have to put in some energy. So we actually need to put in two ATP in order to phosphorylate this molecule. So that's pretty easy. We're just going to take of this ATP, we're going to take a phosphate group from each ATP and we're going to add them to the glucose molecule. This phosphorylation makes the molecule less stable and more reactive, which is good because we want to split it apart. Then our next step will be the actual splitting apart. So that is called lysis. By the way, the entire process glycolysis, or as we pronounce it, glycolysis, literally, literally just means splitting apart sugar. Our third step is then called oxidation. Again, if you don't know what oxidation is or redox reactions, go back to last week's video. If you're familiar with this, you know that oxidation is the loss of electrons or hydrogen. So what we are going to do is we're going to remove hydrogen atoms from these two three carbon sugars that we've created. We're going to use them to reduce NAD+, which is an electron carrier, to NADH and hydrogen atoms. So we are moving electrons from the three carbon sugars to the electron carrier NAD+, which means we've created two NADH. Again, the sugars are oxidized, the electron carrier is reduced. And then finally, the fourth and last step of glycolysis is ATP formation. Specifically, it's called substrate level phosphorylation because we're going to take the phosphate groups that we've added to the three carbon sugars and we're going to put them on adenosine diphosphate molecule so that we're creating adenosine triphosphate or ATP, our energy currency. And so we're creating four ATP here, but because we have expended two ATP at the very beginning, the phosphorylation of glucose, we have a net gain of two ATP molecules. We also gained in step three oxidation two NADH and of course, we have our two three carbon sugars, which at this point we call pyruvate molecules. So there are two of them. As you might have noticed, we haven't used oxygen in this process. Oxygen is actually only important in the last stages of cellular respiration, of aerobic cellular respiration. At this point, we could still go into anaerobic cellular respiration. But for right now, we're going to look at what happens if oxygen is present and we can go down the road of aerobic cellular respiration because aerobic cellular respiration gives a much higher yield of ATP in the end. So next up we have the link reaction which is very short but very important and this importantly takes place not in the cytoplasm of the cell anymore but in the mitochondria. So the mitochondria as we saw at the very beginning 
is important in this process because that's where the actual action is happening. And so we have moved into the mitochondrial matrix at this point via active transport of pyruvate. And this is where the link reaction happens. Something else that is very important is that from this point on, everything that we're going to look at happens twice in the link reaction and the Krebs cycle because we have two molecules of pyruvate. So everything that I described for one molecule of pyruvate obviously happens twice um, for one molecule of glucose that we've split into two molecules of pyruvate. So the link reaction has a couple of points we already know and something new. The first thing that happens is called decarboxylation. So decarboxylation means we are getting rid of a carbon. So we're actually turning this three carbon sugar, pyruvate, into a two carbon compound. The carbon that we got rid of leaves as CO2 when it combines with O2. So here we can already see, and that'll keep on happening, uh, how you know, we're breaking down the sugar, and then CO2 is, of course, as we know, the end result, but only a byproduct. The two carbon compound we've just created, we're going to oxidize. So we're reducing one of our electron carriers, NAD+, creating NADH, and in the process, we're taking electrons from the two carbon compound. We're also getting rid of hydrogen from that compound. That is always what happens when we oxidize something, right? And so because of that, and because we add something that is called coenzyme A, the resulting compound, this two carbon compound, is called acetyl-CoA, because the loss of hydrogen causes an acetyl group to form, and adding coenzyme A gives us the name acetyl-CoA. So we have two compounds of acetyl-CoA, the link reaction is over already, and these two molecules are now ready to go into the Krebs cycle, but only one at a time. So when we start to look at the Krebs cycle now, that obviously is always for one acetyl-CoA. So per glucose that we put in, that is going to happen twice. The Krebs cycle is very different from what we've just seen because, as the name suggests, it's a cycle. It can also be called the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, but Krebs cycle is um, obviously a nicer name. So what happens here is that the acetyl-CoA that we've just created in the link reaction is going into an already existing cycle. So we have a, a four-carbon compound, which is called oxaloacetate, and acetyl-CoA is going to combine with that, giving off the CoA to go to help in another link reaction, and then forming a six-carbon compound, which is called citrate. And now the goal of the cycle is to get back to oxaloacetate so that it can stay a cycle. So that means that over a bunch of reactions, mainly oxidation, decarboxylation, and substrate-level phosphorylation, we are going to get back to the original molecule, which is oxaloacetate, and that can then combine with a new acetyl-CoA, and so you see how that works as a cycle. As you can see on my very badly drawn diagram here, one of the first reactions is the oxidation, again, oxidation of our 6-carbon citrate, and at the same time, there's also decarboxylation. So decarboxylation, again, we're taking one of the carbon atoms, it's being given off as CO2, so we already have only a 5-carbon compound. We're also oxidizing that compound, which means reducing an electron carrier, in this case, again, NAD+, so we have NADH carrying an electron, and hydrogen is being given off from the 6C citrate compound. Then we have another round of decarboxylation. We have oxidation again. So again, we're going from 5-carbon now to a 4-carbon compound. We are reducing another NAD plus to get NADH, giving off more hydrogen atoms just into the matrix of the mitochondrion. And then we also have some substrate-level phosphorylation to create a little bit of ATP. We're also going to reduce another electron carrier, FAD, to create FADH2. And we're reducing more of our electron carrier, NAD+. These are the reactions that are taking place in this cycle in order to get back to oxaloacetate, so the cycle can keep running, and in order to 
get these electrons onto the electron carriers because that's what we actually want in the end to be able to create ATP, which is going to be the next step. To sum up the results of what we've just done, if we run the Krebs cycle twice, then everything that we've gotten so far is 2 ATP, 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, so those are the two kinds of electron carriers, and then 4 CO2. And now we're finally getting to the fun part, which is the electron transport chain. This is why we need the electrons. Electron transport chain is sometimes abbreviated as ETC. And there's also chemiosmosis, but that's at the very end. So this is happening at the inner mitochondrial membrane. So the mitochondrion, as you probably know, has two membranes. There is one membrane around the matrix, so the innermost area of the mitochondrion and then another membrane on the outside. So that creates an intermembrane space, a space between the two membranes. And this will be very, very important to what we're doing. The reason we're using an electron transport chain is because we want to use the power of oxidative phosphorylation. So this is not the substrate level phosphorylation we had earlier, but a different kind of phosphorylation. Why phosphorylation? Well, because that's what creates ATP. If we phosphorylate, so add a phosphate to ADP, we get ATP. So the first thing that happens is that our electron carriers that we talked so much about, NADH and FADH2, they're now finally releasing the electrons, the high energy electrons that they've been carrying. And they're releasing them into the electron transport chain, which is a bunch of proteins that are in the membrane, in this inner membrane of the mitochondrion. As we said, the electrons and the hydrogen atoms always go together in these redox reactions. So once the electron carriers give off the high energy electrons into the transport chain, they also give off hydrogen atoms into the matrix of the mitochondrion. And so what happens is we're using the high energy from the electrons they travel down the transport chain and we're using this energy to pump out the hydrogen atoms into the intermembrane space. So from the matrix through the inner membrane via the transmembrane carrier proteins into the intermembrane space. So what we're creating is a gradient. If you don't really know what I'm talking about, go back to the video on transport in cells because it's explained there. And this is very important to understand. A gradient means we have more of something on one side of a membrane than the other. And this is very important because we're using this gradient later on. So now we're off to the next step. The electrons have, that we've given off have traveled down the transport chain. We've used this energy to pump out, because it's active transport, we need energy, the hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space, and we've created a gradient, what's also called a proton motive force, because hydrogen ions essentially are just protons. And so we're using this gradient now because at the end of the electron transport chain, we have what's called ATP synthase. So that is a, another transmembrane protein, which is an enzyme. You can see that because it has ASE at the end. It's always the case for enzymes. And so this enzyme can catalyze the reaction that we need, which is the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. The way that it does that is by using the power of this gradient. Because any molecule will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's the power of the gradient. And so this ATP synthase allows the hydrogen atoms to move from their area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So from the intermembrane space into the matrix. And as they're moving through, we are using this proton motive force, or the enzyme uses it, in a process called chemiosmosis. And so this triggers sort of a rotation of the enzyme, and that allows us to phosphorylate ADP and create ATP. 
So now if you've paid attention, you have noticed that we still haven't used oxygen. We still haven't used oxygen anywhere in the process. So now we're finally there. Step three of the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, or actually slightly before chemiosmosis, we need to get rid of the electrons that have traveled down the electron transport chain that are de-energized or in a low energy state. Because if they just stay in the electron transport chain, it's going to get blocked and we can't run it again. We can't put any new electrons in it. So this is where finally oxygen comes in because oxygen, and I want you to remember this, is the final electron acceptor. So oxygen is sort of the nice guy that comes in and is like, okay, your poor tired little electron, I'm going to take you and that actually creates water in the process because the oxygen takes the electron and hydrogen and we create H2O, which obviously is water. And that is actually another good, good thing because the oxygen binding with hydrogen atoms in the matrix keeps our gradient intact because we always want more hydrogen atoms in the intermembrane space so that our proton motive force is there and we can use it to catalyze the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. And again, if oxygen isn't there, the chain is blocked and the electron carriers that we, you know, equip with the electrons in all the stages before in the Krebs cycle especially, they can't transfer the electrons to the transport chain so it's blocked and it just grinds to a halt. And now one last thing about where this is taking place. We've talked about the matrix, the inner membrane, the intermembrane space. Something very important here is that because everything takes place across a membrane and we need so much membrane space, the mitochondrion, the inner membrane of the mitochondrion is folded so as to increase the surface area. And all of these folds, they're called cristae. And that is also something very important to remember. So increasing surface area, which you see everywhere in an organism, wherever you need this membrane space, where transport across a membrane is super important. So let's look at the bigger picture again for a second. We went through glycolysis, the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain with chemiosmosis. So we created two ATP in glycolysis, that is substrate level phosphorylation. We also created two ATP in the Krebs cycle, again, through substrate level phosphorylation. But because we equipped so many of our electron carriers with energized electrons, we are able to create 32 ATP in the electron transport chain through oxidative phosphorylation. So that makes for a total of around about 36 ATP for a single molecule of glucose that we put into that entire process of cellular respiration. And because we broke it all down, all the six carbon are gone, and so we created six CO2 molecules as well. At the very end, we have also recreated the electron carriers, right? Because we have first reduced them, so going from NAD plus to NADH, but then in the electron transport chain, they give up the electrons, we go back to NAD plus, so that can be reused then.